Actually, what I will present today is a topic of a recent paper uh, which was published in the International Journal of Political Economy. I suppose everybody already read it, so we could start with the discussion. And uh, this paper uh, is about, it used, the paper used the data by Piketty, Saez, and Zuckman. Uh, but the paper is about our view of history, okay? Our interpretation of history. It's based empirically, it's based, and also institutionally, it is based on the uh, US economy. We can discuss other countries if you want, but uh, in a short paper, it was impossible to put everything. So the paper focuses on uh, the United States. And a lot of our work actually is based on the United States. So, as has just been said, uh, we, I work with Dominique Levy, and our inspiration is still a kind of a Marxist in interpretation of econ the economics and history in general, because I was a student in Paris in the 1960s, and uh, I did not change completely my viewpoints. Uh, of course, uh, when I say that we are Marxist uh, economists and uh, it's more than the economy, as you will see, it is the interpretation of history. Uh, I like to say that our Marxism is some kind of a fundamentalist Marxism, in the sense that we are using a number of principles in Marxist uh, understanding and analysis of history, but also it's um, revisionist. Revisionism, in the sense that it's not possible to conserve a Marxist analysis completely for various reasons. And concerning, in Marxist work, you have two aspects, maybe three, actually, philosophy, economics, and history, to simplify. And, uh, well, the Marx is an economist, uh, very sophisticated in Marxist capital, as you know. And, uh, well, obviously, you know, there are also limitations in Marxist capital. Limitations which are due to the fact that we are now in the 21st century, and Marx wrote in the 19th century. But not only that, a limitation which are linked to the fact that, well, uh, Marx uh, did what he, he could, you know, in a life of research and work, very intense life of research, but it did not went to the end of everything. It could be the object of a seminar, not only a seminar, but a, a whole class uh, uh, to explain, you know, what I mean exactly here. But also, you know, concerning economics, it's certainly necessary to revise Marx. There was no mathematics, no data, practically no data. And so there are important limits in Marx. But the foundation of the analysis of capitalism are there in Marxist capital. And uh, the second aspect, which is the uh, economics, no, the, which is politics, you know, uh, also, it's necessary to revise Marx in several respects, and this will be a central aspect of what I will present today. Uh, in Marx, uh, and it's linked to politics, but it's linked to his Marxist analysis of history, uh, of course, you know, the view classes. Okay, this is really, you know, part of Marxist analysis, social classes. And, uh, of course, in, in Marx, you know, put forward capitalist classes and the proletarian class, obviously, as you know, but you know, in cap now we are in what is called in English, and since today the seminar is in English, it's easy, what is called managerial capitalism. Okay? It means that in contemporary uh, societies, uh, the rise of managers, managers uh, is a key feature to understand the transformation of capitalism. And one aspect of our uh, work is that we consider managers as a class. Okay. The concept of managerial capitalism is a broad concept in the United States. In France, you know, it's not well known, but in the United States it's, it's important. For example, in this special issue here of this journal, the second article is an article by William Lazonic, and which is about, uh, his work is a lot about uh, managerial capitalism. And Lazonic made a criticism of our views that he doesn't know at all. But, you know, and so there is a third article by us in which we reply to Lazonic to explain that he, he knows nothing to, of our work. 
So it's not very interesting, but I say that because actually in the United States, yes, the idea of uh, managerial capitalism is a very important idea with the work of Chandler, with the work, and in my own work, you know, I began to work on this in the 1970s because I'm old. And so this is a key as aspect of what we are doing. And I will try to explain what it is about. Well, so I was, of course, you know, if you approach your understanding of economics, politics, and uh, history uh, with this type of perspective, with a, a, a Marxist, Marxist foundations, of course you are a revisionist because you are changing Marx's basic story because Marx in Capital analyzed the rise of the new class of managers in volume three of Capital is completely fascinating because managers already existed in the 19th century, very important in history, but Marx stopped. Why he stopped for political reasons? Because he had this view of class struggle that Proletarian, the proletarian class had to, uh, had to reach the power, you know, and create a new type of uh, society. And so I believe he stopped for political reasons. But now it's not possible because it's a key to the understanding of history, as I will show today. Well, so you see the mixture, you know, of uh, some kind of Marxist interpretation. To simplify a lot, Marxist interpretation means the following. The class struggle is the engine of history. There is absolutely no doubt class struggle is the engine of history now in France, in Paris, in this university. Okay? And so I will show it. Uh, this is a topic of this paper. This paper actually represents some kind of summary of the work that we did during uh, four decades or more okay, with Dominique Levy. So it's not a new story. But the point is that the data, we use the data by Piketty long ago. Because we knew this data, we used that long ago, years ago. A few years, for example, recently, here I show the book, it was titled The Crisis of Neoliberalism. In this book, which was public, published after the crisis of neoliberalism in 2008, okay, we already use a lot of this data, but even before, in many books, we already use this type of data. So, but now, you know, Piketty did, this is our latest book in French here, which was published by La Découverte. Our work is published by Harvard University Press. Why? Why do Harvard University Press publish the work of two uh, French uh, Marxists, quote unquote? I have no idea. Okay, but they, they do it, they do it. And so we have two books with Harvard University Press. And uh, it, the situation for us in France is difficult, very difficult. In the world, it's much easier. In many various countries, it's much easier. Always in English, we write basically only in English, with a few exceptions. But in France, for historical reasons that I will not explain, the situation is much more, much more difficult for us. So Harvard University Press, we publish, uh, publish uh, four books, uh, 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 two books. The first one in 2008 was about neoliberalism. Okay? The second book is about the crisis of neoliberalism. And now we have a, a third contract with Harvard University Press for a very big book that you are going to study line by line. Uh, you will need about three years when it is published, which I hope will be in two or three years, okay? And this book, it's a 500 uh, pages book, and it's about macroeconomics. So if you study uh, post-Keynesian economics, this is, will be the book for you, okay? Because there's a discussion with post-Keynesian economics, with whom we have a very good relationship, okay? Uh, will be the center of the book. The theory of macroeconomics, business fluctuations, everything, okay? This book is not finished. We already worked three or more years and we will need five more years to have it finished, two more years to have it finished. So I don't know what it will be published, but we have the contract and we are working on, on it every day when I'm not doing seminar. So this is just to give you a broad idea. Now, today's topic. 
to this topic is now you have the data by PKT. You have the data, you have a new paper by Saez and Zuckman, which is about wealth, because the misuse of wealth by PKT were not very good. Okay? We published several papers on PKT's work, okay? in particular the, le the latest book. We, the data is amazingly interesting. The analysis is extremely poor, but the data is extremely interesting. And so now we have the new, the new paper by Zuckman, which corrected size and Zuckman, they corrected the data about wealth. And so we like that very much because this is exactly the story we have been telling for so many years without having the good data. So the paper that I will present is exactly that. Now we have this data well said, well presented, we will use it. We don't care about Piketty's story. We, the paper is only using this data to show what? What I will show now, okay? And so you know, you know of course the data, maybe PKT made a seminar here, I don't know. Last year. Last year, <coughs> okay. So, so you know this data and you, you will see how we use it in particular in relation to the idea of managerial capitalism, what I will show now, okay. So we have been working for so much time that what I have to present is a very broad story. I'm very sorry, I would need the three hours minimum uh, to present it, but I will do my best to try to show you what it is about. So we start now with the content. Okay, so I begin with a table. I hate tables, but we like graphs, okay? Uh, you will see the graph after. This is just to, ah, it's no longer working. <coughs> okay. It's oh, disconnected. Oh, okay. Uh, so where is the... She gave me a... Um, ah! Uh, the remote. Oh, the remote is here, so you don't need to get on the... Thank you. Can you? You have it? Because it was working. It stopped because I was not using it. Okay, so it's coming, it's coming. Okay. So here, here you have, um, okay, so you know because we are in Piketty's data, I repeat, we are in the United States. So what we consider in Piketty data is households, okay, all households, okay, all households in the United States. And we disting distinguish between fractiles, okay, so you know that. This is typical of PKT presentation of the data. This is on the floor, poor people, of course, okay? People with high income on top. Now we are speaking of incomes. Please, if you don't understand me technically, please ask, okay? Don't make objections right now. But if you have technical question, stop me, because I really want you to follow what I'm saying, okay? So, fractile, on the floor, People with low income on top, people with high income. Zero, 90, okay, percent. On top, the 10 percent superior, okay? So you are studying in the university because you want to belong to the top 10 percent, okay? Maybe to the top one person, but slightly more difficult. And so, zero, 90. Because it's, it's incorrect. Uh, it's incorrect? Very, very strong assumption. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> 90, 95, 95, 99, okay? So you see how we are progressing here. Here, from 0, 90, we consider the next 5%, okay? And then the next 5% to 99, and then 99, we, after 99, we enter into the top 1%, but the top 1%, excluding the top 0.5%, okay? And here we enter into the top 0.5%, but excluding the top one in 1,000, okay? And then we enter into the top 1,000, one, uh, but excluding the one among, you know, 10,000 here. Small groups, of course, when we reach the top. How many people in the United States? This is 2012, okay? How many people? You have the figure here. This is thousands uh, families. For example, 
top 1 in 10,000. How many families in the United States? 16,000. OK, here this is 16,000. And the top and the, the bottom, you know, 90%. How many families? Here, one, uh, 144 million families. OK? For example, here, the top uh, one out of 10, uh, 1, 145,000 families. OK? So, of course, when we move to the top, we are reaching small groups. 16,000 families, the top one out of 10,000. What is their income, average income, yearly income for this top, you know, $30 million a year, okay? And the wealth, you know, 371 uh, million uh, dollars. So these people are not billionaires, okay? Or maybe some of them are billionaires, but the group is broader. They have here, you know, the, the, the average wealth of the group is one third of a billion, about. Okay. So this is what we have. So between the various groups that I will consider now, there is no overlap. Okay. They are all separated. It's not usually Piketty present data. You know, you have the one person, then the one out of 1,000. We don't do like this. There is never any overlap. Okay, so they are separated, completely separated. So now, what do we see with that? Oh no, maybe I will skip that. Uh, here, we have the data since the early 20th century, and what do do we do here? Each group, okay, on the bottom here, you can recognize the various groups. 0, right, fractiles, 0, 90, 90, 95, and so on, okay? And the variable, what is it? We consider one average family in this group, and we study its income corrected, by, corrected for inflation. So it means the income of the average family in one of these fractiles corrected for inflation which means purchasing power if you want. Because we are over, over a very long period, you know, more than one century. So it would have no meaning uh, uh, without correction for inflation. And so I will sh look at the black dot here, okay? Black dot here, 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 here. Okay, this is for the 90%, 0, 90%. So you can see the purchasing power of the 0, 90 person at this level here, 30, growing here, growing here, and as you can see, flat here, okay? Now, if you look at the top, one out of 10,000 here, you can see its purchasing power here, and then moving here. How is it that all the purchasing power are at the same level in the middle? Because we normalize, okay? We multiply by a coefficient in order to get all the groups here at the same level. Do you understand the technique of that? It's a bit complex, but you are economist, okay? So each curve is the average purchasing power of family in the group. You can see its variation a long time. How is it that everybody is at the same level in the middle? Because we multiplied by, we normalize, we multiplied by the necessary coefficient. Okay, and you will understand why we, we did that. Because, you know, we are interested here in the variation of the purchasing power of the various groups. And during this small period here, we are in the 1960s about in the United States, the purchasing power of each group were growing at the same speed. Okay, so this is the reason why we normalize here. Okay, so they have a narrow belt, you know, in the in the diagram here, in the center of the diagram. And now look at the bottom group, 0, 90. Purchasing power at this level here. This is prior to the Great Depression. The, then their purchasing power rises, rises through World War II, 
grows and rising, goes on rising here, and then total stagnation. This is a very important feature of this income distribution in the United States. If you consider the average family of the group 0, 90, since the 1970s, zero progress of purchasing power. This is extremely important. To us in France, it is shocking, but now we are used to something similar with neoliberalism. There was absolutely no progress of the real income of an average family of the group 0, 90 in the United States since the 1970s. Now, if you look at the top here, one out of 10,000, you can see their purchasing power here, diminishing, 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 diminishing. Not to the same level, of course, that poor people, but you know, because we normalized everything. First period here, a period of diminishing purchasing power of the top group. They move from about two, maybe 200, 150, to here about 100. And then we've and ah, the other groups. Other groups, you can recognize the hierarchy here uh, from the bottom. So it means that there is a convergence of income, okay? Because the group on the top, you know, their purchasing power was diminishing, the group on the bottom, their purchasing power was increasing a lot. This was a, a period of very rapid diminishing inequality, in particular after the Great Depression. So it's basically concentrated, concentrated between the Great Depression and the 1960s, a period of very strong diminishing inequality. Then there is a period of transition. And every group here, you can recognize, as I said, you know, you move, the higher the group was, the more its income was diminishing. Lower group, their income was rising. Fantastic image, you know, of diminishing inequality. Here, everybody grows at the same speed, despite the fact that, of course, incomes are not equal. And then, you know, Stagnation of the lower group, purchasing power of the lowest group, and then incredible rise of the purchasing power of upper groups. A period of rising inequality. Okay? So this begins here. Okay? We more or less enter here in what I will describe as neoliberalism. Basic feature concerning distribution rising, exploiting inequality, okay? And this is typical of what neoliberalism is about, and I will explain that in more details. Same story, you are slightly above the 90%, your income increase a bit, you are more, 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 you enter here into the 1%, you enter here into the 1,000, and you enter here into the one out of 10,000, your purchasing power explodes. Of course, you know, we don't know the money, and Piketty doesn't know the money, and the, the data, uh, tax data in the US do not know the money in tax events, okay? Piketty believes that it's not so important. We believe it's contrary. But you know, what we see here is enough, okay? I would even say it's too much. What you see here is exactly the kind since you come from various countries, this is our society now. I'm absolutely sorry for you, okay? Because personally, it doesn't matter much because everything is done for me, but you are in a society, in French there is a, a word to say that, but it's not used frequently in English. Uh, it means just a terrible society. It's a terrible society, it's awful, it's awful. You are entering into a world which is absolutely terrible from the viewpoint of society, from the viewpoint of inequalities. Here you have two possibilities. You have a choice, you know. Either you will feel some kind of solidarity with people belonging to the lowest group, or you will try to graduate, to enter into finance schools and so on, and belong to the top, okay? It's your choice. Hmm? And so, or maybe you will inherit from your parents, which is much better. Okay, so this is... Most people here want to change the world. Okay, so 
So this is the world in which we are now. And we are now, okay, maybe there are a few people from France. And so what happened in France? Nothing similar, except that it is beginning. This situation, people read Piketty's book and they don't even notice, you know, that this, this is typical of the United States and the United Kingdom. But in France, in Germany, it doesn't exist, except that it is beginning, okay? So we are beginning slowly, slowly, because of historical reason, because of class struggle, as I will explain, we are beginning slowly to move forward and to follow the same path as the worst societies, okay, the United States and the United Kingdom. So, this, we have various things to, to explain here. This is just to try to summarize, you know, what I've shown, shown before. This is the same variable, but schematically here, levels, okay? And this is the first period, convergence. Then everybody grows at the same speed, okay? Then explosions of inequality and new levels. Of course, we might, here we are just considering trends, but we might consider uh, values, actually. So to give you an idea, here, during the period, central period here, the difference between the top, the purchasing power of the top group and the, say, the one out of 10,000 and the lowest group was about 70. Okay, it's a lot. It means that a rich family had an income 70 times larger than the average income in terms of purchasing power of zero, the 0.90 zero person. But it's nothing. It's nothing compared to in the past and now, because now the ratio is about 500, okay? Still abstracting from tax events. And so from this follows everything, politics, uh, war, you know, terrorism, everything. Uh, this is the cost that we have to pay for that. And so now I can show you, no, it's, uh, this is exactly the same story, but instead of considering income, we are considering wealth, okay? And wealth, you see something similar, concentration of uh, diminishing wealth inequality, rising at the same speed, and then increasing. But as I said before, this is probably where the, the figure is uh, not really very good, because actually the wealth of upper group increased certainly much, much more because of tax seven. But this is what we can see in size data, because Piketty's estimate of wealth were not very good, and we believe that size are better to some extent. Okay, so this was about inequality. So I want you to keep in mind three periods, okay? Or four periods, whatever. The first period, levels, distinct levels. Second period from the depression to the 1960s, tremendously diminishing inequalities. Then about 15 or 20 years, a purchasing power rising at the same speed for all groups. Then, you know, a new period, new rising inequality, and then new huge level of inequalities in the last period, okay? And so, well, I already gave, gave a number of figures, so I will skip that. And uh, now we are speaking of inequality. Now, I will tell you about the composition of income. And this is how I will be back to my story about managers. Because up to now you have seen maybe 20% of the story. So now I move to what kind of incomes. I'm no longer speaking of inequalities. I'm speaking of what kind of incomes do they have. Simplifying, we can say two types of incomes. Okay, one type of income will be wages, for example, and uh, of course very important. Second type of income I will call capital income. Okay, capital income, it means, as you know, dividends, it means uh, 
against the stock market. It means uh, uh, interest that you receive because you have all the securities and everything. So now the question here is the ratio of wages to the sum of wages and capital income within various groups. First group I will consider, so you understand that. Now we take a group, one group, one fractile, total income. What is the fraction of this total income, the percentage of this total income, which is wages, okay? So we consider the 0, 90. Over time, the group, the bottom group, 0, 90, but very broad, okay? And you can see, for example, today, 2011 here, that maybe 95% of the income of this group is wages. It's obvious, okay? Because we are dealing with the bulk of the population, so they are wage earners. Oh. And they have some, some capital income, okay? Because they can own uh, also rents, you know, from uh, housing, you know, or they have some interest, they have a stock of, they have a, whatever, some kind of capital income, but it's very small. And you see, it's rather stable. After World War II here, uh, it was uh, 92, 93, okay? Now maybe it's 96. And uh, it's increased a lot, you know, with the depression here. Why? Because this was a society of small, uh, very small capitalists, like uh, shopkeepers, for example. Okay, because some shopkeepers, they make, you know, some uh, uh, profits, you know, so, so this changed a lot. We enter into this new type of society. Now, the other group here. The group here is the 99 to 1 person. So this is a famous top 1 person. Okay, the top 1 person. So we move from the basic 0, 90 to the top 1 person. And the, the question is the same. What is the composition of their income? And you can see something very strange, which is in the 1920s, their income was 40% wages, which means that 60% of their income was capital income. Okay? So this group, the one person in the 1920s, they were basically capitalists. Okay? Because it's a group with a high income, because they belong to the top 1%. 60% of their income is capital income. Dividends, profit that they pay to themselves, any kind you know, of rent on houses and so on. If you look today, you see that their income was uh, recently 80% wages. Which means that the top 1%, which are people very high income, Okay, now, today, 20% of their income is capital income. 80% is wages. And what you can see, which is very nice in this curve here, I'm speaking of aesthetic and not a social evolution at all, uh, you can see that actually it's a very steady rise of the percentage of wages. It means on top of social hierarchies in terms of income, now we are in a society more and more of wages and high wages. This is the managerial aspect. Where do the money go now? To managers. To be the one person, you have to be a big manager, okay? But lower, we see the same type of evolution, lower in the hierarchy. Now, on top, these people, they have 20% of their income as capital income. It means that they have one, maybe two months of wages, you know, as because they have money in the stock market, okay? So they make also profits, of course, because they have very high wages. Maybe they have wages of $20,000 a month, okay? So, of course, when you do that, you can spend a lot, as they do, actually, but you also save some money, so you will also have capital incomes, okay? So it's a very steady transformation. And the conclusion of that is that on top of hierarchy, you will see later, I will show 
the one out of 10,000, okay? And you see here the growth of the managerial society. Where does the money go today? Of course, to capitalist classes to some extent, but it's not so big actually. Where does the money go to high wages in a managerial society? But it's not only a problem of incomes, it's also a problem of who is doing the work. I will show it later if I have time. Who is managing, who is organizing? Because it's of course manager in private corporation, in particular financial managers, but it's also officials in the government. Some of them are making quite a bit of money. Okay? We are in a society, the surplus we can say. Huh? It goes to wage earner on top of social hierarchy. It's very, very strong, and this is the reason why we speak of managerial capitalism. And I will show it returning to the type of graph that I have shown before. Before, I have shown almost the same graph. It was about the purchasing, average purchasing power of households in the United States, the period of convergence the period of parallel growth and then the period of diverging, you know, trends, rising inequality. Now I show exactly the same story, except that we consider only wages. There is no capital income. We consider all the households and we consider only their wages. And you see that actually, you know, it's basically the same story. So actually, Wages are absolutely the crucial component of the uh, transformation of inequalities that I have shown before. You can also notice maybe that the reduction here is smaller. The, the increase here is very high. Okay. Wages in the new society, wages in this year of what I would call neoliberalism, the explosion of inequalities is really wages. Capital two, but basically in terms of masses, it is wages. <coughs> and this is a feature of the new managerial society. In contemporary capitalism, in contemporary managerial capitalism, inequality increased tremendously due to the rise of capital income, but mostly 90% due to the rise of high wages. This is extremely important to understand because people even in the left, they don't want to change their ideas. So they keep telling with the same raps, you know, telling the same story, but this story doesn't fit the reality now. Now I will move to neoliberalism. Oh, rather I will explain a little more. The first period from the Great Depression to the 1960s, we call it the we call it sometimes a post-war compromise. We call call it some kind of compromise between managers and popular classes. We are in a society of diminishing inequality, tremendously diminishing inequality. We interpret that in terms of classes, in the sense that. There was some kind of social alliance in France, in the United States, because we are speaking of the United States, that it is possible to call some kind of a social democratic social order, or it means some kind of a Keynesian social order, if you want. But Keynes, Keynes not in the sense only of macroeconomics, but in the sense of uh, social relationship much more generally. What happened after World War II in particular? If you study, if you read our books, if you study economic history, you will see that there is a very important change, which is many important changes. First, the way corporations are managed. After World War II, corporations were managed by managers in the US. You know the story about the technostructure, for example, of Galbraith, okay? So it seemed that capitalists no longer exist, practically. You, we will see that in the data in a while, okay? 
But, you know, we are in a society, managers are managing corporations. They want to be the captain of a big uh, ship, you know, uh, with a nice technology, new innovation and everything. They distribute some dividends. Sure, they distribute some dividends to the owner, but this is completely unimportant. Policies. Policies of the government, growth, employment, education for people, health, okay, social protection, welfare, if you want. Policy which are completely different. We are not in a globalized world, although they are gradually opening the frontiers. If you read the book in French, you will see all the details of that. Okay, so, but you know, we are really in a completely different society. Then neoliberalism, 1970s, 1980s. First, dictatorship in Latin America. Okay, you know Pin Pinochet, 73. Okay, you know Videla, 76, okay, and so on. Brazil, Brazil even before, but it's more complex. I will not enter into the details of that. But, you know, what happened then? Chicago boys, okay, progress of new ideas, but these new ideas have been built to serve the interests of the upper classes. And so, class struggle, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, a huge social fight to take the control of universities, to take the control of the press, okay? A newspaper, to take the control of radio, of television, and everything. And, you know, all these ideas, which are called neoliberal ideas in the sense of free market, but they don't care about the free market. The important thing is increasing the income and wealth and the power of upper classes. And this was a huge victory in many countries, in particular in England with Margaret Thatcher. Of course, you know, resistance of workers. So you have huge strikes, huge strikes of workers which are not always poor workers, you know, like in airplanes, you know, and everything. But, you know, very big strike. But finally, victory. And if we had more time, or if you read the book, I would have to discuss all that, of course, in relation to the political forces which are supported, supporting the, past, the social democrat order after World War II, and above all, of course, the failure of the country which were claiming that they were socialist countries. Which means, first, in USSR, they gone in China, you know, and I'm not, not speak of Cuba and everything. Complete failure of this type of societies. And so, the victory of upper classes, traditional classes, like capitalist classes, was easy in this respect because of the complete failure of this. So we enter in a new period where we are now. In the period now, you have three crises in the world. Some kind of economic crisis because of the incredible features of neoliberal economics. You have a second crisis, which is ecology as you know, and we are not maybe in a crisis now, but it will come soon. Huh? And the third crisis is a crisis of utopia. There is no more utopia. And this is one of my favorite topics, and this would be you know, another topic for discussion, beginning with the French Revolution, even slightly before, moving to the new idea of emancipation of humanity, Moving to the early 19th century, the socialist idea, the communist idea, which are calling to the firm. But all that be begins before the French Revolution. Okay? And then how it is developing. And finally, the repression of uh, worker movement, in particular in Germany, where maybe it was the most advanced, and the victory in USSR, and later the victory in China, but you know, with some kind of military approach which allowed for the victory, but finally, this type of society do not appear as society of emancipation for the large, large segment you know, of uh, workers uh, of the rest of the population. So it's a complete failure. And this is where we are here, in a society which has victory of upper classes, and the other end, crisis of utopia, it's hardly possible to speak of utopia. I would love to do it here, okay? 
beginning before the French Revolution to the present would take some time in a detailed manner, but we are now in the society, all these kind of ideas just appear ridiculous. Why? Because they failed once in history. And humanity will need, you know, maybe 10, 50, 100 years to recover the sense that we don't have to live under neoliberal rules and neoliberal ideology. But it will take a lot of time because it was a huge historical failure. And so I said, you know, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, we enter into neoliberalism. Chicago boys arrive in uh, uh, Chile. They arrive everywhere, actually, even in our universities in Paris. Okay? The content of the teaching changed completely in economics, when I was teaching economics, completely different. Now, maybe you are here in, here is one exception, okay? One of the few exceptions, you are lucky, but you know, basically it's like this. Everywhere in the world, I'm constantly traveling in Latin America, in the United States, in China, in Japan, and so on. So, but globally, including in China, it's a huge victory of the other side. But, you know, what I did not mention, which is crucial, is that this victory of capitalist classes to restore their power and income would have been impossible without the alliance with the rising classes of managers. Because the social order after World War II was actually governed by managers in alliance with popular classes. So you get education, health, everything. But now in neoliberalism, you have a new alliance at the top between, you know, top managers, but managers in general, and capitalist classes. So, it would have been impossible without this alliance. And so you have to combine two stories. So far, I told two stories. You have one story, which in Marxist term is a story of transformation of relations of production, of emergence of a new class pattern with a class of managers, in between popular classes and capitalist classes. This is one story, okay? Now you have another story, which is a story about class struggle, which is alliance between classes. After World War II, alliance between managerial classes and workers, in the dynamics of the worker movement, actually, they don't care so much about capitalist classes. They manage corporation policy in a certain manner. Policies are completely different. And then neoliberalism, a new victory, alliance at the top. In France, was more difficult than in the United States. Because a key concept, of course, in neoliberalism was maximizing shareholder value, as you know. Managing the economy, defining policies, defining globalization in order to increase the income and wealth of, of upper classes. And a lot of that was based on maximizing a quotation in the stock markets, okay, the indexes of the stock market. And they succeeded incredibly. They were incredibly successful be in real term between the 1970s and 2000. They multiplied in real term, you know, the value of the stock market by five times. Since there, you know, they are fluctuating more or less with the crisis in 2008 but it was an incredible success. So now, I will enter into some more details into the feature of neoliberalism. So I will provide you new information, still based on the same data, on income. So here, we are in the United States again, and we are in the top one out of 10,000. 16,000 families in the United States, okay? Average wealth, one third of a billion, but many billionaires, of course, in that. Huh? So the question here is their income, okay? Their income, average income, 30, billion, uh, 30 million a year for what is known. This average, this income of this group, of this top group, what was, the, what percentage it represented of the total income of all households in the United States? Okay, so for example, we are here, we consider the one out of 10,000, and we are in 1930 here. Paradox, paradoxically, we are in the Great Depression. 
And the question is, the, the income, total income of this group, one out of 10,000, what percentage is represented of total income of the income of all houses in the United States? The answer is here, 3.25 percent. Okay? So 16 families add about 2% uh, of total income. And you see the same story I've said before. Here we are speaking with capitalist classes. Huh? And you see what happened with the Great Depression, what happened with World War II, what happened with the worker movement worldwide. Incredible decrease, you know, of the concentration of income at the top. These people were losing their income. They were losing also their wealth in proportion that it is difficult to imagine. And the point is that it lasted, look here at the minimum, 70, 1970. From 2 to 5% here, they are here as less than 1%. This is sometimes called in the United States financial repression. Okay? They were losing their income. But they were losing much, much more than that. Why? Because, as you probably know, after World War II in the 1960s, the taxation of high income, income tax, was huge. They could pay more than 90% of their income. The only possibility they had was to finance a university or a museum so they could avoid taxation. Okay? But it was no longer their actual wealth. And so, all of Piketty's size data are always before tax. Because the data doesn't exist after tax. We don't have this data. So you can assume that actually the true figure here would be here. This very rich family were completely losing you know, their uh, dominance over society. And as I said before, starting with the ratio of wealth to the wealth of the 0, 19 person, you had ratios of maybe 500, 300, 500, and declined to 70. 70 is still much more than a basic worker, of course, but it's nothing compared to 500. OK, neoliberalism, OK. So this is a huge victory. There is absolutely no other foundation to neoliberalism. The ideology, neoliberal ideology, and practices, because <laughs> there is a neoliberal ideology, but neoliberal is true practices, okay? And they succeeded to impose, you know, an incredible restoration, and even more, and I repeat, tax even. So we are here, okay, on top, I don't know where. Incredible restoration. So is a key. Neoliberalism is a class phenomenon. They were able to win because they were strong, because the others were weak, okay? And so they won. And now we can look at the composition of their income. And you will see something else very important. Total income here. You can look at wages. Wages is a curve here. So you can see that actually the fraction of their income, of their restoration of their income due to wages is huge. <coughs> maybe half. So not maybe one third, let's say. Okay? They restore their income with capital income, but they restore their income with wages. What happened? They now sit in boards of directors. They pay to themselves quote unquote wages, including stock option or I don't know what. Okay, these sons and daughters of this family, they are becoming the managers of big corporations. So you see that capitalist classes were able to restore their income due to the rise of their uh, of capital income, but also due to the fact that they enter, okay, they jump into the new bandwagon, which is wages, high wages. Okay, there is some kind, it's like in the first transition from the, what is called Ancien Regime, there is no word in English, okay, to the capitalist society in England, for example, uh, during the Industrial Revolution. There is some kind of mix uh, uh, between 
the various categories of upper classes in the sense that the former nobility now they enter into business okay the big capitals they want to they buy land they change their name you know to appear in Europe at least like uh, uh, belonging to the nobility they marry the daughter to the son of a big uh, industrialist or whatever so there is some kind of a uh, of merger between top classes just like now in a managerial capitalism managerial neoliberal capitalism the rest will be entrepreneurial income so if you look at entrepreneurial income here entrepreneurial income means it's not capital income in the sense of dividend interest okay or rents is an entrepreneur which pay to them keep some part of his profit after in the 1970 almost zero and then it recovers so why does it recover this is due to taxation because in the US you can have and in France you have the equivalent uh, which is you can have what is called S corporation S corporation means it's a small corporation which is not public in the sense of not being in the stock market and you pay to them say for example in France there was a lot of about that in the press in newspaper because of Madame Betancourt okay Madame Betancourt she has some kind of S corporation S corporation means she puts money and she pays you know uh, people very high wages who graduated from HEC or I don't know what and so from the university and so they manage the money and she pays to themselves what she she needs to make a living okay a good living okay and so this is an S corporation and this is uh, the benefit the profits from S corporation are called uh, entrepreneurial income this is something which did not exist uh, before the 1980s and in neoliberalism it rose a lot okay so I did not control at all the time I was speaking so many thanks because I thought I was already late <coughs> okay okay thank you and so uh, this is basically what I wanted to tell you uh, very rapidly and uh, may, but I will now show you little more details okay because it's really very nice and it's not in, so much in the article there are just a few explanations about that but I want to show that to you it's basically in this book okay this book explain, exists in Portuguese Spanish you know French where it was published and Korean you know Chinese but it doesn't exist now in uh, English okay so far and uh, but you can look at that even if you don't read French you ask a friend okay so uh, this is what I am going to present now very strange society neoliberalism capitalist ownership yes capitalist families have shown you know what they did in neoliberalism the kind of a merger between some new uh, alliance some kind even some kind of merger be between top classes you know and so on. how does this system work there we have something extremely interesting which is the work of econophysicists okay Dominic Levy was a physicist okay he graduated from polytechnic and then he was in physics in the center, National Center for Scientific Research doing models and the structure of the matter but after 10 years he was bored and so he decided to move to economics okay and this is how we began to work so Dominic is very he has a capability to understand the work of physicists and uh, so now you have a group of people uh, which are known as econophysicists these are people who are physicists you know but they look at economic data and they believe they think that uh, economists are really dumb okay and so they do the work and uh, we use two of these two of these uh, uh, works in particular the one I'm going to present and another one which is extremely nice but we don't have time for everything for everything which is in the appendix to this article that you can find on the internet on our web page okay and so the other one is also very nice but I'm going to present only this one and then I will stop and so what is it here it's called the <coughs> necktie okay 
It's called the necktie. And uh, what is it? It's a huge set of data, maybe with 12 million firms in the world, all big transnational corporations. So now the unit of analysis is a firm, okay? Enterprise, business enterprise, a corporation, okay? Including 12 million, you know, all big corporations in the world. Also, there is a number of very big capitalists, just a few, which appear in this set. So what is the logic of all that? These econophysicists, they do, it's nice to have a choke, okay? So these economists, what do they do? They have 12 million firms. This is one dot, one firm. It can be a very big uh, uh, transnational corporation. This firm, the second firm here, these firms hold stocks, okay? Stocks of this corporation. So we draw an arrow, okay? It means that this firm here owns some of the stocks, stock shares uh, of the other corporation here. The other corporation own stocks of another corporation here, okay? This is what they work on. They have, this is the reason why economists have difficulty with that, 12 million dots, okay? And so it's a huge network of relationship, relationship of ownership. Do you understand that? And if you don't understand, you tell me, okay? Because I see some people here which in to, to tire to some extent, okay? <laughs> uh, but I, it won't be long now. And so this is a network of ownership. It's not only ownership. For example, here we can have a financial corporation and they have stocks on the other corporation here, but not because they own the stocks, but because rich family give to the financial corporation their money to be managed, okay? So they are managing the, the wealth of other people. But they have the power to sell, to buy, you know, stocks of various corporations and so on. So it's not only uh, ownership in the strict sense, it's more control, okay? This big financial corporation has the power to uh, buy, to purchase, to sell the corporation of this corporation here. And then they will keep part of the benefits, of course, but some of the money will go to the households, you know, the rich households that we have seen before. So you study this network. So, so you, it's just impossible, apparently impossible to disentangle, you know, because you have 12 million with arrow in every direction. And some of these arrows are big, big arrows. Others are, are thin, you know, why? because it means that the corporation owns a little bit of the stock of the other and so on. So they handle all that, okay, you turn, and you get the <coughs> this image here, huh? which is a necktie. What is it? You make all that, so you, this means here, for example, that you have, I don't know how many corporations are, then all the old stocks of one another. So it's just like a bowl like this. I will show you later uh, in one minute the details of that. So you understand the logic of that. And then, uh, this group here, they all the, the stock of the others. And actually, if you look here at the, really, the, this bowl here, it's a network of one all the other, one all the stock of the other, it's a big family, okay? And uh, now, here, the next time, really. Here, they, all the corporation here, the old, another corporation here, Kichol, these are big old corporation in the world, non-financial corporation, because these ones are financial corporation, and they all the stock of the other. But of course, a big financial, a big non-financial corporation have affiliates, okay? If you look at Apple, I don't know what, they have affiliates, so it's a, so you get the image of the tie, really here. So you understand that? 
Why is there? I will return to that in one minute. This is something specific that they don't understand very well. But also, you have ownership which goes this way, outside. Okay. Sometimes it starts here. It starts here, and you have here the rest of the world. People who do not belong to the neck to the time. Okay. What is it? China, for example, because in they contend that with their 12, if you look at all this network here, which is interconnected, they control 90% of all the profit in the world. Okay. In this system here, you have 90% of the profits of the world. Here, you have the rest. It's outside of the system. Okay, so far. But probably it's moving forward here. So, here, the necktie, which is the financial corporation. So, you will recognize them because I'm going to show you a picture now. So, here it is. So, of course, it's very simplified because it's impossible. Here, you have a minimum of 150 big financial corporations. And, for example, Citigroup, this was just before, this was in 2000, 2007, just before the crisis. Bank of America, okay, State Street, Goldman Sachs, Beerstein, okay, Morgan, here, okay. But you also have Barclays in the United Kingdom, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, uh, there is something about France somewhere, uh, whatever, okay. So they own one another. The big arrows here means they own a lot of the stock of the other. And the arrows in the back, it's really very nice, you know. It means that they own some, okay, which can be large amount. So the capitalist world, the world, the managerial capitalist world is governed by what? By this type of ball here that you can see here, okay. It's a big family, or what calls that, whatever you want, okay. And they own one another. There is absolutely no competition here. No competition. Maybe they compete slightly to some extent, but they own one another. If somebody is making some profit here, part of this profit will go there and so on. And then, you know, if I move back to the other image here, okay, it goes to they own the rest of the world. Okay? So the question is this is a, the system. Now, you live in this system. This is a system which allows for the incredible rise of inequality. This is a system which is exporting this system of inequality, neoliberal ideology around the world. And now you can, because they give a lot of data, very complex, but a lot of data, you can try to locate France. You can try to locate the United States. You can try to locate Japan and everything. And with huge historical transformations. And what is true is that so far, there was some distance in continental Europe from this system. Okay, uh, continental Europe, but now we are entering into the system. And of course, you know, we get the rise of inequalities. We get the big wages of managers as we en are entering more and more every day into this system. And terrain means that the arrows become bigger. Okay, it means that they just don't have little bits, you know, of stocks, you know, but gradually they have more, okay? So, this is what is happening now. Who is organizing this system? Big managers. You have two categories of managers, financial manager. Financial managers are the manager belonging to this group. The other managers are, where are they? They are in the uh, board of directors. The managers of the financial system, they sit in the board of directors. They hate when one manager of not belonging to the big family at the center sits in various, in various boards of directors. They hate that. They try to destroy that everywhere. Now they are destroying that in Germany, they are destroying that in France, they are destroying that 
In Japan, they destroyed that long ago, okay? And, but so, they are completely transforming. This is really, I, I will stop now, okay? They are transforming that. So, of course, you know, they are managing, in a sense, in the interest of capitalist classes. Because maximizing shareholder value is their task, okay? Maximizing shareholder value. But above all, paying to themselves huge wages. And we see that if you study, if we study in more details, we see that very well. For example, during the 2008 crisis, they practically stopped paying dividend to shareholders. But they went on with their own very high wages. Okay? Of course, you know, because they are really. So this is a system which is really typical of the features of managerial capitalism now. It's a system, in a sense, it works, you know in the direction of maximizing shareholder values, but it's managed by big managers, and there is a huge problem of relationship between the manager of not financial and financial, okay? And this is where we are now. And as I explained, in a very pessimistic view, this system now is getting, getting a lot of importance. So far, they have 90% of the profit in the world, but of course, they want 100% and they will have it soon if you don't if you do not react okay so i will stop here and uh, thank you for your patience Okay, so just a quick structure of what we're going to do. Alexandra is going to start by framing your theory as a kind of descendant from the managerialism that began with Berlin Means. Then I'm going to introduce very, very briefly some Marxist debates on the middle class as a means of drawing out a kind of theoretical tool set and of framing what we think are three conditions uh, that a theory would need to fulfill in order to make the argument that managers have been a deep part of the historical process of capitalism in the 20th century. And then we're going to throw up some challenges to a theory of managerialism by looking at, ironically, exactly the literature you were introducing at the end here on interlocks and on uh, pyramidic ownership, and then on the uh, financialization literature. And I should also mention here that a lot of what we're going to argue is coming out of Lazonich's work, but we weren't actually aware of the debate that was in this issue, so it's drawing on some of his earlier papers. And then based on that discussion, we're going to come back at the end to the income data and ask a few questions around that. So uh, thank you, Professor, for um, your presentation, for being here. I will start briefly with the theory of managerialism, and then I will uh, talk a, a little bit about uh, your idea, your vision of managerialism from your paper. So we cannot speak about uh, managerialism if we don't talk about the modern corporation and private property of uh, Birl and Mintz in uh, 1932, uh, because they introduced the concept of uh, the, separation, the separation between ownership and control. So um, the, vision, the vision they uh, have, the vision they uh, transmit to us, it's a negative vision, we can say, because they are uh, aware, they are worried for the presence of uh, a self uh, a reproducing oligar oligarchy in uh, of small groups uh, where um, there is no uh, accountability to their owners who gave them the work or to the society and this uh, negative vision we can say uh, was shared um, also by Schumpeter Lipset um, concerned about uh, the lack of democracy uh, since the separation of no ownership control uh, the, opposite, the opposite vision was given by Bell, uh, Darendolf and Parsons, uh, where Bell, Darendolf and Parsons, um, who saw in this uh, separation uh, the contrary, like the occasion to have more democracy. Uh, so about your vision from uh, uh, the paper, uh, we can uh, talk about the managerial revolution directly. So um, 
is um, uh, the revolution of corporate and, uh, the, um, uh, and the help given to the corporates uh, by financial institution. So uh, managers uh, are viewed as a social category, a social class, a third class, and they are also the new upper class. Um, and going quickly to the um, theory of classes you uh, presented in the paper, uh, we can say that managers play the central role because uh, it depends from their alliance uh, if they decide to have the alliance with the uh, social group, we uh, have what you, you, tol uh, you told about uh, before. So um, the post-war period, the post-war compromise, or if we have um, a rightist alliance so with capitalists, we have uh, what we have now, so the neoliberalism. Okay, so we could say that um, most of the great controversies in Marxist debates on class arise from the fact that, at least in a post-war period, uh, this famous prediction from the Communist Manifesto of the great polarization of society into two camps seemed uh, not to be coming true. Instead, we had the opposite. We had a proliferation of all sorts of middle layers, of middle classes, of higher skilled white collared workers who still had to earn a salary but might have possessed some sort of labor power, some sort of uh, control over the conditions of their own work. And of course of, of, of new managerial layers who seemed to occupy some sort of position of domination in the relations of production but which wasn't uh, based on ownership. So broadly, there have been uh, two main responses of Marxists to the challenge of the middle classes. The first is perhaps more prominent amongst the political left, and it is to basically say that a lot of what we're seeing is surface level in some way. When you strip it away, we can, we can really fundamentally reduce everybody to basically being complex versions of either the exploiters or the exploited in society. So the fundamental uh, binary class relation kind of remains. The second approach, uh, which arguably is more prominent within academia, instead takes the opposite position and says that these new middle layers are not reducible to being either capitalists uh, or workers, that these changes actually represent actual concrete transformations of the class structure, and instead, therefore, we have to understand these new layers as being somehow um, complexly straddling different class locations within the society. And this is the approach that's taken by Nico Polonsas, by Guglielmo Carcedi, but perhaps most famously by Eric Olin Wright. Hi, boy. Um, and he has, uh, he's built really an entire sociological career on this. He's written loads of books and loads of papers. So what this is really is just a very, very, very simplified extraction of one part of his theory that we're going to try and apply to analyze uh, the paper that we've just seen. So he starts from the kind of orthodox Marxist position that uh, classes are based on one's relationship to the productive assets of the society and that this determines the strategies of reproduction of the agent. In other words, what you have determines uh, what you have to do in order to survive. Um, but he contends that these relationships are never simply recused by the binary of ownership and dispossession. That in fact, class rights are and have always been unbundled and transcribed by the different power dynamics of the society, and that this isn't a feature that simply arises with the separation of ownership and control in the modern corporation. It's actually, when we get down to the concrete reality, class structures have been complex across every stage of capitalism, and indeed of mode of productions that have preceded it. So instead what we have is a situation where concrete individuals, as I just suggested, actually occupy multiple locations at different moments in the social whole. That nobody is, is, is fundamentally reducible just to being one or two of the other fundamental classes. But he's insistent that uh, this shouldn't lead us into a trap of seeing class as somehow an attribute of the individual. Class really is about a relational structure of the society that defines how different agents uh, uh, interact and behave. What is wrong with this thing? 
Um, so this leads uh, right to, to advocate a kind of functionalist uh, uh, method where he says that the number of class categories that we're going to deploy should depend on the object of our analysis. So if you're looking at something very finite, if you're looking perhaps at uh, voting behavior in a, in a particular locality, you might want to use 12 or 14 different varieties of class. If you're looking at very big questions, it might suit us to go back and use the two big abstract uh, fundamental characters. So Wright uh, uh, prescribes this as a useful method of an analysis, but really what we observe is that actually this is almost always how class analysis has functioned. And certainly it appears to be uh, deeply entailed in Marx's own method of the progression from the abstract to concrete. And we can think about this uh, in capital, where across volume one at the most abstract level, we have just workers and capitalists. By the time the analysis is concretized a little bit in volume three, we have rentiers introduced. And in contrast, when Marx is uh, uh, analyzing a concrete historical situation in his political journalism, for example, in the 18th Brumaire, we have a multiplicity of different social agents who can be conceived as, as, as class actors because their, un their position is understood based on a relationship relationship to productive assets. The other thing to be said is that for all the um, sort of iconoclasm of Wright's work, a central theme through its big transitions has been uh, the defense of what's ultimately a quite orthodox Marxist axiom, which is the idea that the middle layers don't have strong fundamental material or political interests of their own, and so tend to be pushed and pulled by the capitalists and the proletarians at different stages of the political uh, conjuncture. And he writes a lot about exploitation and an understanding of, of how we should see exploitation and the way that the absorption of labor remains the fundamental feature of a class structure that might have complexified in other ways. Okay, this is driving me away. <laughs> so we need to ask then, um, what, what are Dumenil and Levy asking in this paper? In other words, um, in order to understand what class does in their work, we should be looking at what it's trying to explain. Now, self-evidently, they're looking at a very macro view of social evolution, of stages within capitalism, or even possibly between capitalisms. Um, the periodization that they use of pre-war, post-war, and neoliberal, of course, is very common across uh, political economy. It corresponds roughly to what a lot of regulationists would be saying. It corresponds also to what uh, Marxists using the long wave theory are, are using. But there's a sense in which actually what they're talking about is something even broader to that. Because they're introducing a new class and a fundamental shift in the relations of production, which traditionally within Marxism has been used to signify epochal breaks between modes of production. The point, uh, either way, is that they're really talking about very broad social phenomena. Social phenomena that arguably most traditional Marxists would stick uh, to two classes to, to analyze. So obviously this puts a lot of weight on a theory of managers. If managers are going to be used to explain not just interactions at the level of the firm, not just small interactions, but how we move from different historical phases, it's going to demand that there's a, that there's a clear basis to understanding who managers are and why and how they act. <coughs> So we can think that we can outline perhaps three uh, conditions for a theory of managerialism to be able to understand stages of capitalism. The first is that the basis in the class structure to manager's position should be a deep feature of actual changes in the relations of production as opposed to just a transitory institutional manifestation of capitalism that might disappear based on a different political conjuncture. The second is that there should be a social group in society that behaves according to and corresponds primarily to managerial class locations. Which is not to say that there cannot be, like with the other classes, lots of contradictory people in between, but there should be, like there are, a group clearly who are capitalists and a group clearly who are workers. There should be a group that are clearly managers first and foremost. And the, <coughs> the last one, and this is, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps the most significant because it's an element that in some way is missing from uh, the theory of Dumenil and Levy in, that's presented in the book at least, where we're given a quite clear idea of who managers are in a class structure, as in they are people who own a salary, they are people who have control without having ownership. 
but we're not given an idea of the agencies that follow from this, the material interests, the political affiliations, the ideological inclinations that are related to managers. And uh, we would think that that needs to be an important element of this theory, again, if we're going to define how managerial interests within a, a triadic class struggle are able to shape the direction of history. So the next uh, sections of this paper are now going to draw on two different bodies of literature in order to, to challenge uh, the, the theory in this way. Um, and, and these, in fact, are, are bodies of literature that perhaps have been most responsible for causing the eclipse of managerial theory within mainstream sociology and political economy. Because I think it's fair to say in the post-war period at the time Parsons and Dallendorf and people were writing, managerialism was actually completely dominant. You know, the majority of sociologists uh, uh, writing at that time prescribed to a theory something like this. It was dominant even across the political spectrum. Whereas today, it's not really theory that's spoken about much, which I think is what makes uh, Dumini Lin Levy's theory uh, so provocative, so interesting, but also so difficult to defend. So one of the reasons for its eclipse uh, began with attacks that started in the 70s. And here this guy Zaitlin, I think he was a Marxist himself, was one of the key figures. And he went back to uh, the data of Berlin Means and to later managerialist writers. Um, and he actually unpacked things a little bit. And he showed that most of the firms that Berlin Means was saying had undefined relationships of control were actually ultimately controlled by owners. And there's a long body of thought in the same tradition con continuing right up today, which is actually showing that uh, when you look at complex uh, share ownership, it tends to be that you can find an ultimate owner that, that retains control. The second angle of attack was based on, Corey was an early writer in this, who did a study on J.P. Morgan's empire and investigated the way that his influence was able to operate not just through share op ownership, but through the credit relations that he presided over, through personal business relations, and through interlocking directorates. And so these uh, lines of thinking were picked up again in the late 70s and the 80s by various writers who made the argument that when you had this dispersal of, of share ownership and you had a seeming uh, diminishment of the power of shareholders, actually what filled the gap there was finance capital uh, as opposed to some kind of insider managerial uh, class. And this kind of segued into the literature on interlocking directorates which emerged in the 80s, first with Mintz and Schwartz who did the first big study which showed that every US corporation was essentially connected um, to each other through uh, exchanged board members essentially. Um, and of course, uh, the, the paper that um, Professor um, Duminil was introducing at the end, uh, built by Vitali, which is looking at these uh, complex networks that exist now at a transnational level, is essentially also a descendant of the same literature and makes a similar argument that within these big bow tie structures of mutual share ownership, uh, it is finance capital that sits at the powerful, at the powerful nodes. Um, so the, the kind of general point coming out of a lot of this literature was that there was a methodological error in the early managerialists, that they had an overly internal focus of looking at who was in control of the firm without situating these firms in broader environments uh, of, of power networks. Uh, and so it was kind of showing that once we do that, once we look at the influence of finance capital, managers never, insider managers never really had as much power as they were ever claimed to. They were always responsible to the imperatives of ownership. So about finance and the role uh, finance played on uh, managerial behavior. Um, histor um, speaking about uh, historical trend, we can say that uh, the post-war period uh, there was a financial repression. So um, the number, for example, of our, um, bankers sitting on the board of firms declined from 65 to 46 percent from uh, 1912 to 1974. And uh, the way uh, corporates decided to um, survive, it was uh, uh, through the principle of retain and reinvest. So um, all they needed for uh, their investment uh, was, took, uh, was taken from their uh, gains. 
um, but in 70s and 80s something changed and we have the Employee Retirement Income Security Act and um, uh, there's um, the end of legal restriction so uh, new players are on uh, uh, on the stage. And we have, uh, for example, um, uh, all the institutional investors, so mutual funds, pension funds, life insurance companies, that now are allowed to invest in uh, uh, short-term uh, companies' uh, gains. So uh, what happens uh, is um, um, shifting, shifting on financial firms uh, from supporting long-term investments uh, mm, to capital gains and uh, uh, corporate uh, securities. But um, the same, uh, another shifting process, uh, it hap happens to uh, the corporation. Because um, in this period, uh, 80s, 90s, there's a big pressure on uh, the role of managers. So it's a period in which in economic uh, in field there's uh, the um, appearance of uh, the um, theory of uh, um, principal agent, agency theory. Uh, so uh, companies are, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, managers are uh, um, um, accused to be undiscipl undisciplinated and uh, opportunistic. So with uh, different interests from stockholders. Um, <coughs> so uh, under this pressure, managers have to take a choice to or to stay on the principle of retain and reinvest, or go towards downsides and distribute. And it was I and it's exactly exactly what happens in the 80s, 90s. So top managers downsize corporation they controlled, cutting the size of the labor force, uh, bringing so more profits for corporation, but cuts of uh, workforce. Can you change, please? So in this uh, shifting situ situation, what happens is uh, that the top managers uh, align their interests with external financial interests uh, rather than uh, follow the interests of the productive organization uh, to which they uh, belong. So uh, we have uh, this new principle of uh, shareholder value maximization and um, we have this moment in which manager uh, becomes also uh, owners. So um, the uh, manager interest um, started to be directed to short-term gains and uh, there's no distinction between ownership and control. Uh, in at this point, it's important to ask if uh, the independence of managerial class is still possible because uh, they become again owner, owners. Uh, another mm, a little bit complicated issue is uh, the way um, you analyze Piketty's uh, and Zuckman's the sites, uh, data. So uh, what you say is that uh, you can abstract from capital gains because they don't affect uh, trends, but from uh, Piketty insights, uh, we know that capital gains have a substantial impact on composition uh, levels. So we have uh, two different uh, mm, tables uh, in one, um, the capital gains are considered in uh, another they are excluded and uh, we can see that uh, for example for uh, the top fraction if we consider of uh, uh, population um, the result w with capital gains and without are completely different so for example um, the wage portion of income of the top fraction in 2007 uh, drops from 40, uh, 48 and 38% uh, uh, to 30 and 17%. And then uh, this, um, we can say, um, diminishes the revolu revolution in uh, wage income that you focus on, on your paper, on you present. So, so there is such a 
it's the <laughs> this is the nine 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 two one. Yes, all the groups. <laughs> so the main point with just these two parts. So the next complication comes in also because the paper presented in the data um, is done generally as a ratio of wages to all capital income. Uh, so when we actually go back and decompose that, uh, the story becomes a little bit weird, especially when we're looking at the, the timing over here. So first, just to contrast what happens um, in the graph you showed, Uh, about the secular rise in the wage share of top incomes, which was the argument for the kind of ongoing managerialization. Actually, the trend is kind of different when we're looking at uh, most portions of the top 1%, which is the relative group here. In fact, the surge in wages only starts in 1968 and goes up until about 1984, just before the kind of leveraged buyout uh, revolution begins, and then uh, tapers off. The other strange thing is that for these three groups at least, this sudden increase in the wage part of the, co part of the composition comes always at the expense of entrepreneurial income, which as you explained was the income that is going to uh, sole proprietors, partnerships, and only in the later period to these uh, sub substandard S companies or whatever they're called. So that immediately suggests a possibly a different interpretation of this, which is the massive period of restructuring and of concentration and centralization of capital that was taking place throughout the 70s as US firms faced up to the competition arising from Japan and from Germany. So that actually it's not really about a surge of managers, it's about centralization and the absorption of a lot of these uh, uh, small firms. Why that then tapers off in the 80s is not clear, and in particular why you have this resurgence again of the small, uh, of these uh, substandard S companies is also not obvious, but I would guess it's somehow linked in uh, to financialization. The other very interesting thing is the, is the shares of this top, top fragment, um, which as you can see, you know, right up until the late 70s, getting the vast majority of its income from dividend earnings, which then completely drops off. And I think that's when you really see the total transformation of the stock market from being actually a funding market to being a market uh, for corporate control. But here again is where the complications with leaving out uh, the capital gains really, really hit you because, I mean, as we can see from what Alexandra has just pointed out, if we put the capital gains back in, the wage share of this actually drops to below 20%. And this doesn't look like a managerial group at all. It actually looks like a traditional uh, capitalist class. And this, I think, is something that's going to be particularly relevant in light of the fact that it was so central to Piketty's own argument about capital gains being a real ve vehicle for inequality, but also other authors like Jan Toporowski, who talks about the era of, of asset price inflation. We don't actually have returns based on dividends and these sorts of things, but on, on how you can build up asset prices. Um, and this relates to kind of broader uh, complications with being able to use this income data to map um, to map class struggles, the uh, class structures. Um, the first issue being that uh, we don't have a sense of whether these trends are being driven uh, across or within individuals. So, uh, you know, in, in other words, we don't know, for example, whether this is about. Uh, you know, massive restructuring, or whether it's about certain managers, whether there's just a whole lot more people earning wages as opposed to there being uh, much higher wages uh, uh, for for these CEOs and things. Um, and it's just it's it's a basic problem when the whole discussion of of whether or not managers are an effective class and that is about you know very fine degrees of complexity within the class structure at the top level, uh, where we've already kind of tried to point out that individuals themselves never correspond neatly to class locations. They sit across class locations. So we shouldn't expect income streams to be directly uh, uh, linking to, to the division of classes. So actually the answer might come in exactly what you point out at the end of the paper and what you started to, to touch on at the end of your discussion, which is this process of merger and of alliance at the top of the spectrum, where you have capitalists themselves becoming managers. But we would ask, in that case, 
are what we're seeing, is what we're seeing then not simply the reintegration of ownership and control, and essentially then the euthanasia of the managers, qua managers, managers as a class that responds specifically to a position of control without ownership. The question that really arises, are there actually specific agencies related to managerial positions that are substantially different uh, from capitalist positions? So we just had a few questions. Yeah, so given all these elements and their complexity, um, some questions. For example, does it still make sense to think of separation of ownership and control? And is there still a manager class or merged managed capital group? And uh, what do managers do exactly? And uh, what are the agencies and political interests associated with managers? And uh, at the end, can income data be used to map class structure, given the contra contradictionary nature of the upper classes? Thank you. So you can answer to those questions, then we can collect some questions from the audience. <coughs> and maybe we can go back to the original position. <coughs> okay, we well, have about six pages of the questions <laughs> to be discussed, huh? so you will have to stop me at some point. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Okay, so, so I will try to be fast, although it's impossible, but... <coughs> so first, thank you very much, and I'm impressed by the work that you did, extremely serious, and the documentation and everything. And actually, we'd like to discuss every point, you know, although it moved rather fast, so maybe we'll we keep discussing later. And uh, because it will be impossible to go to the end of everything. And so, uh, but uh, congratulations, it's really a very nice uh, comment, and extremely documented and everything. So, so don't expect me to really answer very well, you know, but I will do what I can. Uh, so first, you know, you went to, to the literature on the managerialism, which is very good. You said at the beginning, but privately, that uh, maybe Lazonic played a role in this. Uh, uh, well, for, well, the story of the managerial ideas in the United States it's a, is very difficult, okay? Uh, because I never succeeded really to really I identify the origins. Okay. For example, we constantly use, of course, Bells and Mean, and you, you mentioned you know, the negative vision that we stress. And this is, by the way, the object of the debate with Lazonic in the other article that you can look at that. Uh, well, I think it, it begins more, uh, before that. Okay. Uh, for example, I was surprised that you did not mention you know, Veblen, okay? because usually people will, would begin with Veblen. But it's not a big deal for me because, as I said, you know, the origin I is obscure, you know. Often, you know, when in a paper we write uh, managers, people say, oh, you need a footnote with uh, uh, this name or this name, you know. And Chandler, for example, why don't you? Well, good, Chandler come, came in at some point, but it's a very long story in the United States. And uh, you mentioned Schumpeter, yes, of course, you know. Although, you know, uh, Schumpeter is more, you know, about the uh, idea of socialism. OK, uh, you are speaking of uh, the 42 book, uh, of course, eh? I guess. And so, so uh, Schumpeter is more about the idea of socialism. I, I, I hate socialism, you know, but we will have socialism because it's necessary. And, but you, you are right to, to look at that in the, uh, in the history of managerial ideas, you know, because Schumpeter was understanding. Schumpeter is very good, OK? Uh, in particular, in France, there is a lot of his work which exist originally only in German, which is amazingly interesting, you know, about, uh, uh, about uh, history, wars, and everything. So when I refer to Schumpeter, you know, it's really very, very interesting. And uh, <coughs> so, so, you see, it's of course, Schumpeter's idea, you know, of the necessary passage to, to, uh, to socialism, but this Schumpeter's socialism is a managerialism, okay? It's not really socialism in the sense of Marx. Uh, in a sense, it's really, uh, except, you know, maybe uh, uh, collective ownership of the means of production, but this is what we call a managerialism, cadrism in French, okay? And so, so I will not criticize really your, 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 
the historical presentation that you made. And uh, if you have more, maybe we could discuss at some point if you have more references, because always, you know, I have difficulty to really try to build a nice, uh, uh, to, to, to locate the roots, you know, of this type of ideas in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, now, now the reference to Olin Wright and to this type of analysis. And uh, I published my, myself in book in, seven, in 75 that I wrote in 71 uh, about managers, you know, but using Marxist capital because as I said at the beginning, so it's very uh, uh, related to this type of literature. Uh, so you see the difficulty there, it's uh, for me, it's in our work, there is a very important distinction methodological distinction between the evolution of relations of production, uh, which means in a broad sense, huh, uh, and the second level, which is the level of what we call social orders, which is a political level. Or if you want to be more, to be clearer on this. First, class patterns from the viewpoint of relations of production, okay? Now, on the basis of a given pla class pattern, alliance among classes, function, distribution of the work among classes, political alliance among classes. To, to us, these are two uh, distinct levels of analysis. And the type of literature, like Olin Wright, is a complex mixture of the two types of, of, of uh, uh, determination, which are not equivalent at all. So they read, you know, the 18 Britomer, and they say, okay, in Marx is always more complex and so on. But no, you, you, you need really to return to Marx's method in capital. Marx's method in capital, you have basic concept, and you arrive at the end of capital, and you find, of course, the worker, the proletarian class, you find the capitalist, and then you find landowners, okay? And you can move using even more of capital and so on. So this is a theory really basic theory of class pattern, which is based on the basic concept and uh, structure of Marx's analysis of capital. Now, if you move to Marx's political work, it's related to that, but then it becomes a different story, okay? It because, of course, you have all the complexity of history, all the complexity of hybrid relationship, which is a crucial concept in, in, in our work, you know, which appear. Why? Because history is in constant transformation. And there is something, you know, really stupid in, in most of Marxist analysis. You say you have feudalism, you have capitalism. Okay, in between we you have the ancient regime. It's extremely complex. And I'm doing a lot of work on the concrete history of uh, England, in particular the Industrial Revolution, the period of the French, uh, of the French Revolution, transformation, the mechanization, but also political struggles and ideas in this period. If you enter into this, into this type of complexity, you have to deal with this type of hybrid uh, social relationship, the type of transformation. For example, I'm struck reading books now about class struggle during the Industrial Revolution in England, and I read what? Management was doing that. We are in, in, uh, uh, in uh, 1790, we are in 1810, and I read in the books by historians, oh, this is a problem of management, this is not the problem of the owners. And often the owners are speaking like that. They say, okay, now I read also that actually capitalists in this period, because of class struggle, were introducing some kind of hierarchy among workers, which were pre-managerial hierarchies, in the sense that one worker was responsible of a team with five other workers, and they were paying him more, okay? So what I'm trying to say is that, of course, in the US, you have the managerial revolution at the end of the 19th century, but if you read the literature on the transition between the 18th and 17th, <coughs> between the 17th and 18th century, you find capitalists speaking of management. You find capitalists dividing the worker with now worker which are better paid than the other and which organize production and everything. So you see all the managerial forms, of managerial relationship which are already appearing, okay? So the difficulty is there, where are we, okay? 
are we going to say that we are already in a managerial capitalism? Well, you have uh, managerial elements which are appearing, you know, uh, and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that when you move to concrete analysis, when you mix up political determination with really uh, uh, relations of production, you enter into this type of complexity. But now I go back to Marxist capital. It doesn't mean that you cannot, you know, or you should not determine a class pattern which corresponds to a certain mode of production like it appears at the end of Marxist capital. The problem is that Marx never wrote the theory of a managerial relation of production. And we are forced to now think of hybridation. But to think clearly of hybridation, you need the two uh, sets of re social relationships. Okay? So it gives you all in right. Okay? But I disagree from the point of view of the methodology and from the point of view of the conclusions, you know. I completely disagree with this type of approach because they are mixing up type of completely uh, different determination. And well, so, but I, I stopped because would be, I could speak on that for a long time. And with really, you know, reading history is crucial. Reading history, I mean, the book by historian, it's absolutely crucial to understand transformation, because this is what we are living now, which is a, well, I will go back to that. Okay, so, uh, bien, uh, what is clearly a manager and so on? It's always the same. This is a, this problem of hybridation and so on. Now I move to, to rapidly to Zeitlin. I, I met Zeitlin in the past. I don't know if he was really a Marxist, you know, because you just had to mention the name Althusser, for example. Because first book that I published was in Althusser collection, okay. So it meetings I think was impossible to see Althusser. So I'm not sure, you know, if he would. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure he was really a Marxist in this sense. But Zeitlin, he, he, as a sociologist, you know, I respect actual researchers, people who are doing the work. So as you probably knew, he studied the uh, class in uh, Chile. Okay, the relationship with the Chilean ruling class and the U.S. and England, how, you know, the relationship, family relationship. And he said, you know, it's stupid to distinguish between capitalists and managers. Why? Because the family, the father is the owner of the firm, okay? The son is a manager on the firm and his cousin is there. And the cousin is in the government, is the Ministry of Finance and so on. So we move to the type of approach which, as you know, that you do, did not mention, which is in the US power elite, okay? And of course, there is a conflict between the notion of power elite and class structures. But actually, it's not, to me, it's not a real conflict. It's really, you should combine the two types of approach. There is absolutely no doubt that classes, uh, families in upper classes, they try to concentrate power. They try to concentrate power, which means there may be somebody in the government, maybe somebody is a basically a capitalist owner, the other one is a manager, one day he will inherit from the management. Because we are in a managerial capitalism, okay? So, so the power means that you must be everywhere, just like in, cap in present day capitalism. But we should not mix up, I repeat, basic pattern of relations of production, and a political alliances, organization, power elite uh, relationships. So, so it's true, you know, this complexity. If you look directly at this type of complexity, everything is mixed up. This is reality. This is concrete history. But it doesn't mean that you do not need the reference to, to relations of production in Marxist sense. With the difficulty that we have no theory of managerial relations of production. So... <coughs> You mentioned other. Now, now the reference to, to, to finance capital and the type of things that we, we had that, okay? We, we have a concept which is a concept of finance. Concept of finance we define as capitalist classes and their financial institution. There is, it's, you have financial corporation, but you see, the problem of finance capital is that you have two ways of thinking of finance capital. One way is, the bad way. Non-financial capital, financial capital on the other side. This does not exist, you know. You have to see a system which is a hierarchical system. 
Of course, as I've shown in the, in the necktie here, you have financial corporation which are controlling the rest of the economy, but you do not, it's not good to think of on the one hand financial capital, on the other one non-financial capital. It's true that you have financial corporation and non-financial corporation, but capitalism must be understood as a system with a hierarchy. And of course, you know, ownership is located at the center. But now I ask the question, who is doing the work in that? It's an important thing. Of course, financial corporation, non-financial corporation, but it's a system. Who is doing the work? Who is really controlling all that? Managers. But of course, also owners are behind. And managers, this category of upper management, they are also capitalists because we are in complete hybridity. And this is also, you know, where I rapidly mention history, and I said, you know, in the Ancien Regime, of course, you have exactly this mixture, you know, merger of determination which come from the earlier feudal order or the, the Ancien Regime. On the other side, the new capitalist relation of production. Who was, were these people, you know? They are the owner of a big industrial corporation. They marry their daughter to a big landowner, which come from the aristocracy. They change their name. And this is typical of this type of, of transition, because now we are in a transition. So, so you have this type of merger, this type of, and of course, it's very difficult to analyze, because we are not dealing with pure, pure uh, category of social relation. We are really dealing with real history, which is a process of transformation. So I'm sorry, I really go <laughs> not fast enough, but too fast. Uh, so the problem of an uh, uh, institutional investor, if you move, we move to finance, of course I did not discuss that because uh, you, we have to move fast, but what they do, they do, they give their funds to manage to, to the, the necktie, okay? They did their funds to manage to the necktie, so it's, uh, it's another category of institution, but it doesn't change fundamentally the basic, uh, the basic determination because some people believe that we are beyond capitalism now, like Aglieta, I don't know what, because we have a big pension funds, not at all, okay? And so, uh, I cannot read what I wrote because I was writing too rapidly, okay? <laughs> uh, and so, so the, 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 the division, here I'm back to the distinction between relations of production and power and class alliances, okay? And you said, so somebody, you said at some point, uh, uh, manager become owner, okay? How to, to distribute the functions and so on. We have to be clear in the next time, who is doing the work? Upper management, okay? There is no power I mentioned, for example, very rapidly, in the crisis, they kept on paying very high income and they stopped distributing dividends, okay? Because we are, what is the internal logic of this system? The internal logic is capitalist managerial. It's impossible to go beyond this type of hybridity. And how to understand that? It is a combination of the two logics but what we say is that you cannot abstract from the new logic, which is the managerial logic. And of course, yes, you are right. When I presented the importance of wages and so on, I abstracted from capital gains because that is very complex. Of course, if you include capital gains in the income at the top, the importance of wages is much lower. But if we believe in managerial capitalism, it is not because of the wages of the top one uh, bit, uh, among uh, 10,000. This is not the basis of our analysis. We see that, which is interesting, okay? But because we are referring to much broader groups, managers are maybe a few percent, five percent, or I don't know what, of uh, total, you know, uh, uh, households, you know, they are managerial households. We, we, it's interesting to see because of hybridity, what I mentioned, the hybrid character, to see that wages are appearing even at the top, but this is not the basic of our contention about managerial capitalism. They can always pay them to themselves wages. It, doesn't, it would not change the nature of relations of production. If we are in a managerial capitalism, it is not because in, within the top one uh, out of 10,000, they pay themselves some wages. This is not the basic reason. This is one aspect, you know, but this is not the basic reason. It's because we, 
managers are really controlling the system and so on. In a combination, of course, this is the meaning of the alliance between managers and capitalist classes. This is the meaning of the hybrid, hybrid character, you know, of the two set of relationship. They manage in the interest of capital. We saw that in the incredible rise of the stock market, okay? But they also manage in their own interest. And we see that now in the transformation of the structure of income, their own interest is extremely important. Now, is there some kind of social identity of managers? It's difficult, and I did not enter into that at all, okay? For example, uh, I will be very fast. In France, we have a socialist party. Socialist party is a party of managers, okay? And so it took them time, you know, then really in this, the, a lot of time. But they move. They, they would not say we are in favor of neoliberalism because neoliberalism is our own interest. They say globalization is modernity. Okay? So we get, you get Delors and France, you know, abandoned the earlier, you know, chimeric uh, view of uh, socialist transformation and we enter into the new system. Do managers have a political identity? Political identity? Yes! This is the reason why they are now in this alliance with capitalist classes. How do they express themselves? Everywhere, okay? Because they are the people who write, they are the people who speak, you know, and, and so on. So what is a managerial idea? You know, well, of course, concentration of power uh, in their hands. But what we show in our framework of analysis is that managerial uh, ideology is a managerial ideology, but it's completely condition and highly determined by the type of alliance that they struck with other classes, either popular classes after World War II or capitalist classes in neoliberalism. Because, because of their position within contemporary relations of production, they have a choice. They can be on one side, they can be on another side. What is sure, they are serving their own interests. But they can do it in two manners, either with the islands at the left, which is with popular classes, or at the top. And of course, you know, then you get two views of two, two managerial ideologies. These managerial ideologies are one aspect of in common, of course, you know, but they also have very important differences depending on the type of alliance that they strike with other classes. Okay, so this we would have to to, to discuss all that in, a, in more details. Now, there is one thing, and maybe I will finish, but I, have, I would have so many things to say. Uh, and also your, your question. The, it, there is something I did not mention at all, okay? Because it's, it's very broad, but if you read our book in French, or even the book that we wrote, m several books before on that, you will see the following. It is extremely important to relate this type of mechanism to what happened in the country who claim themselves to be socialist country. And here we are back to Schumpeter when I said that Schumpeter socialism was a managerialism. You know, people uh, from the regulation school and so on, they will say, oh, this is uh, uh, state capitalism. State capitalism is absurd, okay? There is always, in, in, a, in a type of society like this, in, if it is a capitalism, a specific category of capitalism, there is always a ruling class. There is always a dominant class, okay? There is no class society without a dominant class. So it's not the state which is the, the owner of the means of production. Indirectly, through institutionally and through complex mechanism, this, is, this was a class of managers, okay? So the, the emphasis that we place on managerial aspect of capitalism is very tightly related to the way we understand the failure of the emancipation movement in the world and in particular in the so-called uh, socialist countries, okay? The problem of this managerialism is that it was a managerialism which was built, which did not come out of history, out of a gradual transformation of relations of production as it is coming now. Originally, so they created, you know, they created a type of ma managerialism from one day to the other, very bureaucratic because of this, uh, uh, the, the, the way in which it was created, actually, okay? And so, so it was a complete failure. They would have been able to, they should have been able to reform themselves, 
not to build a real emancipated society, but if you read, for example, Moshe Lewin, okay? Moshe Lewin, a book uh, uh, about uh, USSR, he's the best specialist, maybe he's dead now, but he was the best, the best specialist in the world of uh, USSR, and he wonders why we are not able to reform themselves uh, after World War II, you know, and this is exactly his analysis, but they failed. They were not able to build a class democracy because all of our democracy are class democracy, like in France or in the United States. In USSR, they should have been able to, to build that, but probably because of the development of neoliberalism, they were not. So the emphasis that we place on managers is certainly the understanding, our understanding of the history of capitalism, our understanding of the transition between uh, the uh, feudalism and capitalism, the study you know, of history, uh, of the history of the period of the Industrial Revolution and all that, but it is also the, the fact that we need a framework to also be in, in, in capable of incorporating the history of the failure of socialism into the same framework uh, of analysis uh, of social relations. Okay? But the problem is that when USSR you know, moved back, to, and, and later China now you know, moved back to capitalism, Capitalism was no longer the capitalism, the managerial capitalism in alliance with popular classes as in France. They could have reformed themselves in this particular direction, okay, which would have been progressive if you compare with what existed in those countries. But they move in particular in USSR, but now it's much slower in China. They move to managerial capitalism. It was completely crazy transformation, you know, with the appropriation of the means of production and so on. But this is, with a different content, with a different story, this is a story also of identity of managerial classes. And in USSR and in China now, they chose to transform themselves into something similar to the classes in neoliberal, uh, uh, cla capitalist classes in neo in neoliberal capitalism, which is a catastrophe, a regression of history. And you, USSR did that madly, you know, and now in China they are doing that more slowly, you know, but with the same violence and plus hypocritical aspect, you know, and because actually I'm a failed sinologist, okay? So I studied China language and everything for so many years and I read uh, many things. And, but, you know, this would be another story to speak about what happened in China and in USSR. But our framework, the ambition of our framework is to incorporate those two facets of history uh, in the later century. So I'm very sorry because I skipped so many things very interesting that you said. And, but I hope we, we keep in contact. And in particular, I would like very much to discuss with you uh, about the, the origin of managerialist ideas in, uh, in the United States and the origin because, as I said, I never had the time to really go through that seriously. So if you wrote anything on this, um, maybe you write a dissertation <laughs> uh, on this, I would be very happy to, to speak with you about that. I'm sorry, I speak very violently, but you must understand that I'm very motivated by what I'm doing, you know? So, so don't be irritated by the way I react because, you know, it's just that I'm working, uh, I've been working all my life, I'm still working nine hours a day on this, so, so I cannot uh, be qu really quiet, okay? Hi, Christopher. Um, so I, I, this is sort of jumping right off of one of the questions or topics that they covered in the presentation. But kind of getting back to this question of who are the managers when we picture them, is this more of something based on an income level or something based on some degree of control? Because just thinking broadly as far as if we're talking about people who have control over other people in the workforce, there's a lot of managers who don't come anywhere near the 1%. And then on the other side, looking at this 1% data, there's a lot of professionals and people in finance who you wouldn't consider as managing anyone else necessarily. They're not your stereotypical image of a manager, but they would be represented in the 1% data. So I, I guess that's, my question is how, how close 
are is the image of a manager to the actual representation of who these people in the 1% are. And if there's a divergence between the two, does that complicate the story? And if so, do we have to bring in things like the value of education and the changing dynamics with that and things like financialization? Can I answer rapidly? I would like to, if you want to take all the question, but I will try not to be too long. You want to collect the questions, OK. No, no, I, I will try to, because I, f I tend to forget, OK. So, so uh, well, first, you know, we don't say that manager only in the one person. I said the opposite, OK. How many? In PKT's book, for example, you will see that he, he calls managers to 10 person, OK. 10% uh, is probably broad, okay? But uh, it's not possible. I mean, using data on income cannot define a class, okay? It's very helpful. But the use of data is mostly helpful n to show the history of the, the, the pattern of inequality, to show the concentration of wages on the top, okay? It's not that you give me a figure, I tell you this guy is a manager because he has a high wages. No. It's not possible to do that. But the point is that when you look at the concentration of wages at the top, as in the graph that I've shown, you see that something happened in history. History is not boring. You see diminishing inequality, then parallel, and then explosion you know, of inequality at the other extremity. So the use of income incomes, uh, statistics are extremely important to understand these historical dynamics. Okay? Now, you know, on top, if we say, I, we don't know, you know, if, a few persons. Uh, now, who are managers? Okay, who are really managers, and what is the meaning of managing? First, you know, you have many fractions. Okay, you have fraction, of course, of financial manager, the guy who are doing our now, you know, huge uh, wages, and who are controlling, you know, the the necktie. And but you also have technical managers, and they need to pay them because now they are you, uh, many firms have to call retire people because they can no longer find a good engineer to build a bridge okay because they, the good engineers they move to, to financial sectors okay so so this is a, a work for, from sociology that we need Unilever sociology of labor okay you you can read you know there are some books you know on this type of issue uh, of course you know in management there is a lot of uh, control of other workers, okay? A, a person who is controlling a large uh, number of workers, you know, this is a managerial aspect of the work. Controlling means of production, but also controlling other workers. Well, but there are other aspects. And for example, in a sense, a university professor is a manager, okay? They, they make some money, okay? They make uh, five, six uh, thousand euro a month, okay, they have a nice retirement, but they are not, of course, in, on top of the pyramid. They, they usually, except, you know, the president of the university, they don't have so much power on other people and so on. But a manager in a, in a big corporation now, they can have a huge amount of power on, on other people. So, so, I mean, we are not able to answer really this question, if this question has a meaning, because there is always a problem of boundary to, to be found, but this would be more, uh, you know Christophe de Jour, for example? Probably you read Christophe de Jour books on uh, 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 misery, no, not misery, but uh, suffering in France, suffering within enterprises. He is the expert of that, you know? So it shows you really the nature of this relationship to other people, the power that you have on other people and to modify their life, you know, completely, their conditions of labor and so on. So this would be a kind of a manager of a sociological approach. And we, we, we don't do that, OK? We don't do that. And of course, it would be related, I would stop with that, to other aspects. And we don't study that, OK? For example, when we book, read, wrote the book uh, la, in French, La Grande Bifurcation, we told, because they asked us, you know, La Découverte, to write this book. We did not want to write this book, but they asked us. And we said we will write a chapter about the way of life of managers and so on. And they told us, don't do that, you are not sociologist. Okay? And in a sense, it's true, you know, because the way of life now is defined not by bourgeois class, it is defined by managers. It means what? Two uh, sex relationships, you know, uh, weddings and so on, uh, in a certain manner, 
in which the inheritance plays much less role. But the fact of meeting at the university and so on is much less important. The fact of traveling, everything. The way of life, jogging, you know, this typically managerial feature of our societies, okay? Typically, okay? Because it's a completely new way of life. We are not in the traditional bourgeoisie. If you want to see the traditional bourgeoisie, go to the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, okay? I love music, so I go sometime, and when I enter, we, you see the bourgeois class. Completely different. This is not, the, these guys now are not dominating ideology. They are not dominating culture and so on. Who is dominating culture? Managers now. And with, of course, very important fraction of managers, which are more intellectual profession. Because they are the guys who write, the guys who publish, and everything. Okay? All that is perfectly true, and our work is very limited in this respect. And in a second life, maybe, I will do the sociology of managers. Hi, my name is Joel, and I wanted to ask you, um, going back to uh, La Sonic and Sullivan, uh, share the concept of shareholder revolution, that it's, that it's much related to this uh, change in the objectives of, well, of managers going from the maximization of the rate of growth of the enterprise to the uh, rate of, um, uh, to the maximization of the rate of profit, uh, however you, you measure it. So my question is, from um, Marsic's point of view, would you agree that for so many years the main objective of uh, the most important uh, corporations was the maximization, not of the rate of profit, but f of the rate of growth? Because I, I was, um, it's, it doesn't convince me much. Well, Lazonic, uh, that it's not so much a maximization of the rate of profit, it's maximization of shareholder value, okay? Lazonic is completely maximization of shareholder value. And in our reply to his comment, which is pretty bad actually, in the journal here we say, well, of course maximizi maximizing shareholder value is a crucial aspect of neoliberalism. But in neoliberalism you have many other aspects, okay? Many other aspects, okay, like globalization, like financialization, all these aspects are related. You cannot, uh, you cannot just focus, you know, on maximizing shareholder value. Uh, shareholder value is a crucial notion that we use, the maximization of shareholder value, but the tra neoliberal transformation is more globally, I would say, maximization, restoration of the power and income of upper, class, upper classes with the alliance of managerial and, uh, and at the top of the top, merger of the two groups, you know, and so on. This is what neoliberalism is about. So, so was, was it, I have shown, and we study that in our books, for example, the crisis of neoliberalism here. If you look at the management of corporation, you see co the management of corporation in the United States, but also in France, because we have, we use some data in France, was very suddenly modified when we enter the, new, the neoliberalism social order. Were they maximizing the profit rate after World War II? Yes, to some extent. Maximizing shareholder value? Absolutely not. You have to look at the, the, the management of a firm. You have to look at... Uh, uh, there are se several you know, important books about that which were written in, written in the 1960s, 1970s by big managers saying, well, of course, he's shareholder, but me, I am, my basic relationship is with worker, is with the government, with the state, and everything. And if you look at the data, if you look at income, I've shown the income, you know, the last graph, with the, the extremely small uh, group, you know, at the top, really, you know, they were distributing very little. These people, they were losing, losing incredibly. And in the United States, they were paying incredible taxes because, of course, policies and the government are also a huge component of that. So the point is the type of thing that Lazoni Crione do not understand, which is it's not only maximizing shareholder value. Uh, it's, it's a complete set of transformation. You need, of course, no or very low tax rates on high income. You need globalization, financial globalization. Why you need financial globalization? Because you can put your money in tax havens. 
And this was a crucial aspect of the recovery of the wealth of uh, uh, very uh, high classes, in particular capitalist classes. This was a crucial factor. Now you know that in the United States they voted a law, which is called the law, the Katka law, okay? Which is every country, including the small island tax haven, will have to declare you know, the names of their customers. And what is incredible is that the Cayman Island, they sign you know, the agreement. Why? Because if they don't sign, they will not be allowed to use the dollar in their international transaction in the future. So you see here very well, you know, how it's a complete system, you know, it's a complete system, management of corporation, maximizing now uh, shareholder value, maximizing, Lazonic do not speak of that, maximizing the wages of top managers. This is much more important now than maximizing shareholder value. How can they maximize? You see the, the, the big guys, the CIO retiring, you know, they, had, they retire with incredible amounts of money. Why? Because of this alliance at the top, because they are serving the interest of, of uh, <coughs> capitalist classes. But you have the other aspect, globalization, financial globalization. You have taxation, you have all, all this system. It's a complete system. And now with a new law huh, on, uh, now, you know, there was a huge rise of billionaires, but with the new cat law in the coming years, it will be much more difficult to become a billionaire. And I did not discuss that, but there are contradictions in uh, the neoliberal alliance at the top. Okay, so it's... Uh, Other questions? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my question concerns the, the degree, degree of competition in the financial sector because uh, at the end of your presentation you said that um, yeah, there's not really much competition because all these big financial corporations uh, own each other, so to speak. And um, I'm, I don't know, I have heard uh, um, contradictory uh, statements about this recently. Also, for instance, uh, James Crotty, who is also writing on financialization, uh, said in contrast there's a lot of competition uh, between these big financial corporations and I'm also wondering I mean if there's not much comp uh, competition uh, what is then the reason for this whole dynamic uh, in this sector that there's so much financial innovation um, very aggressive forms of uh, inventing new financial products new ways of lending and so on and what is yeah what is the driving force in this sector if it's not competition because uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm a bit, I don't really buy this argument that they're just so greedy, more greedy than other people are, and that's the reason why, why they come up with these, all these risky instruments and so on. I, so I would assume there must be some pressure on them to, yeah, to, to act as they do. Thanks. No, no, you, you are right. I spoke too fast, okay? Uh, yes, in a sense, they appear, they appear as a huge body, they own one another. I said it's the same family, okay? So in this, but they impose a huge competition on the rest of the, of the economy, on transnational corporation and so on, because if a transnational corporation doesn't have a 15% rate of return on own funds and so on, they will sell the, they will sell the, the, the stock shares, okay? So, so, but you are right, of course, there is still a huge competition within the system. I was referring to the fact that from the viewpoint of a big trans non-financial uh, corporation, this appears as some kind of upper power. From the viewpoint of one big uh, uh, non-financial transnational corporation, doesn't matter so much that it is, you know, one institution of the other. This is what I meant, okay? But of course, you know, they, they are also fighting for dominance in this system. You are perfectly right. I meant, I was speaking of the relationship with the rest of the economy. Big transnational corporations do not care so much. Can be a, a big uh, uh, English or it can be a big uh, US, you know, financial corporation dominating and imposing the new rules of, of neoliberalism. But of course, they are still fighting, you know, because it's a, it's a big family. But in a family, there is a lot of, uh, of strife, a lot, a lot of fight within the family. You're perfectly right. Mm. Somewhere else?
Okay, thanks for very, very detailed comments. There's uh, a lot I would uh, want to say and want to engage on. Um, but maybe just to narrow down to one uh, small issue, and unfortunately, well, not small issue, big issue, but, <laughs> but framed in a small way. Unfortunately, it's back to a, to a kind of conceptual question. Um, and to me, w the difficulty I'm sensing is that I think there might be in a lot of what you're saying, and I think it's where some of the conceptual clarity is lost, is a conflation of management as such with managerialism. Now, I mean, I guess, I guess it's true that uh, management uh, of, of any sort of uh, productive relationship uh, is as permanent as labor itself in the history of any society. Which is why perhaps it's not surprising when you're reading books from sort of 200 years ago, there are discussions of the dynamics of management that are occurring in terms of interaction uh, at, the, at the productive level. But to me, there's something more specific about the managerialist literature as it arose uh, whenever it did, which is obviously still up for debate, which is the fact that it seemed to be really based on the separation of ownership and control. Um, such that the, the whole definition of why we the people thought there was this transformation occurring in capitalism was that now you had uh, a, a new class that was actually in control of these very powerful enterprises, but that didn't uh, arise to that position purely through property relations. And so it meant that the traditional bourgeoisie defined as simply being an ownership of, of, of the means of production were, were deprived uh, of their power in some sense. And it became a significant thing because the perception was that this managerial class, managers dis uh, controllers distinct from ownership, had uh, a specific uh, political interests, uh, interest agencies and things that, that developed. Now, the, t to me what I read is the revisionist aspect, the very controversial aspect of your theory, is that you're saying that these transformations really were about a deep change in the actual relations of production, where a great many other Marxists and other writers would agree that there was something that was transforming in, capitalist at the, in capitalism at this time, but that it was much more an institutional feature, a feature of the political injunction, a transitory feature uh, in, in that sense. And it meant that when, when uh, managerialism, cap managerialist capitalism, the kind of post-war fortress era came to an end, um, for 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 these other writers mo and for Lazonic and for people following that tradition, what it meant was that you had uh, an end to the specificity of this group in a very powerful position of control of, of a large uh, corporations, but who had specific interests because they were in some way insulated uh, from the the uh, uh, from the power of owners of owners being able to exercise their control through share markets or through finance capital or, th or through other whatever means. Which is why Lazonic and all these people saw the shareholder value revolution as essentially the liquida liquidation of managerialism, because now you had a reintegration uh, of management and control, even if, of course, that didn't mean the end of managers. I mean, we will never see the end of managers. It's inconceivable somehow that, that you have a, a complete simultaneity between ownership and control as though the capitalist would run everything. The point is that you no longer have any distinction, any fundamental interest of managers that is, d that is different from what the bourgeoisie itself wants. And that's why, for most people, it no longer makes sense to talk about uh, managerialism at the level of you know, social evolution of stages, even though if we want to do a sociology of a firm or something, it probably is very significant to look at how managers might differ from the shareholders in one particular instance, but it means that there's not uh, this kind of historical force associated with managers as a, as a distinct uh, group. Yes, very good. Uh, th that's exactly the key issue, you know. I in, our, um, in our revisionist Marxism, if we push to the extreme, but we, we wrote that in the article, for example, and in many other uh, works, uh, books or mm -hmm. articles, crudely, you know, we believe that after capitalism is now preparing a new mode of production that we call managerialism. Maybe we are wrong, okay? This is our working hypothesis. And it's, of course, it's difficult to prove, but it's very strong, uh, in particular if you speak to Marxists, but also if you speak to Lazonic, okay? Uh, we believe that 
This is our view of history. Okay? After uh, capitalism, there will be another. The transition will be very long. Like the transition with the Ancien Regime between feudalism and capitalism, it will be take one, two centuries probably. Okay? But gradually, the ownership, the importance of the ownership will diminish. Okay? And we see that, for example, in the data that I have shown. So you, when you say that Lazenik, for example, would consider share, the maximization of shareholder value as a liquidation of managerialism, I understand very well what you are saying. Because, of course, you know, the maximization of shareholder value in neoliberalism is a key aspect of the new alliance between managers and capitalist classes. Because, in, in a sense, managers commit themselves to a type of uh, action which goes in the direction of the interest of capitalist classes. Be after World War II, they were no longer doing that. Or they were doing it much less, you know. Entering into neoliberalism, this is the meaning of the new alliance. Uh, this is the meaning of the new, uh, this is a key aspect of the new alliance. Plus uh, globalization uh, of the financial mechanism, free circulation of capital around the world, everything capitalist uh, classes wanted. So, so to us, this is not the liquidation of managerialism. The last piece that we wrote on that was the book with La, La Découverte, of course, which is exactly on this topic. So the point is that capitalist classes after the 1960s, 70s, losing much of their income, losing much of their wealth, they stopped that by a class struggle. They were able to establish this alliance with managers. And of course, managers modified their practices compared with the 1960s and the 1970s, beginning at the top. Okay? So, so here we, are, we enter into this strange structure of a, uh, of managerial neoliberal capitalism, which is, but to us, our working hypothesis is that this doesn't stop. This doesn't stop, you know, the transition toward managerial relation of production. I'm not even sure that it slows down the transition. Probably it slows down the transition because we could imagine a transition from the managerialism of the post war decade, you know, toward, you know, more of that, but this is not what happens, so probably it slows it down, but it gives capitalist classes, now I'm speaking of really families of really, you know, the opportunity to accomplish this transition, because they want to remain among the upper classes, among the, the ruling elite, you know, it gives them the time to, to go through this type of, of transition. So of course, you know, there is certainly I mean, maybe we are wrong with this hypothesis, but the hypothesis is mostly a transition between capitalism and neoliberalism, which will take maybe one century or more. I don't know, you know? Uh, li like the, the further transition was, was extremely long. And there are ups and downs, there are various types of alliances, you know? And due to, to the worker movement, there was a very specific period after World War II when uh, uh, managers took a lot of distance with uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, capitalist classes, and then they move back, and now the transition is going on under these new circumstances. But this meant the restoration of capitalist mechanism to, to a large extent. But managers in history tried once, you know, to really accomplish a very sudden transformation in the worker movement using another a type of alliance with popular classes under very different circumstances, and they moved to power. They completely eliminated capitalist classes, which was a very important version, you know, the revolutionary version of that. But they failed. They failed, you know, for some reason that we could analyze and that I mentioned briefly. Now, after World War II in France, in the United States, you get the, the Galbraith, you know, view it's not wrong at all. The problem is that there was a transformation of political alliance, which to some extent give particular forms to the transition, but certainly slow down you know, this transition. But do we believe that the transformation of relation of production is still going on? And this we see also in the data, you know, because there is clearly a transfer of income. 
because people like us were fascinated by the accomplishment of neoliberalism in the sense of the restoration of the income and wealth of capitalist classes. It was absolutely fantastic. But we see, looking in particular at this data on income or looking at mechanisms in capitalism, we see that actually the managerial transformation is not stopped. Okay? It is probably slow down. It is, there is an inflection. Will capitalist classes be able to maintain the capitalist rule of ownership in some uh, diminished form you know, for many years? We have no idea. Because like in the previous transition, the worst of everything is the merger. Okay? Because when, when you enter, uh, if you read the history in the 18th and 19th century, when the merger is accomplished, this slows down history, of course, because you have an alliance at the top. So, so the, the transition, the transformation will, will move forward much more slowly because if you are allied with another class which can, comes from an earlier type of society, you will, of course, uh, try to pre preserve their interests because if not, you, you, you break the alliance. So, so what we say here, it's really a working hypothesis on our understanding of history and our understanding of what so-called socialism was and the uh, reading of history. So maybe we are wrong on that because it's extremely daring and it's extremely ambitious, uh, but uh, our, our interpretation is entirely built on that. So we don't believe this is a confusion between the transformation of relations of production and class alliances and so on, that moving to maximizing shareholder value is the end of uh, neoliberal uh, of uh, managerialism. Not, as you said, not the end of manager because it's completely impossible to deny the existence and the growth of managers. But it would stop managerial relationship to develop historically. So I agree with you, but can we prove that we are right? No, our grandchildren will see. Oh, even after. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to you.